From ancient times to Hollywood, the sword has represented power, justice, and the fight against evil. It's both magical and deadly. The sword has influenced the outcome of great moments in the past, inspired famous myths and legends, and the skill of its makers has turned it into an object of desire. Books on the subject of warfare became available. These volumes by Italian writer Ridolfo Capofero allowed gentlemen to study and collect items surrounding their interest in the sword. The sword was becoming an academic pursuit. These graphic images are quite shocking. They don't hold back on the effects of sword fighting, but they also show a new kind of sword, the rapier, designed for a lethal thrust. These new swords were fast, light, and well-balanced. This was a new style of fighting, not just for soldiers, but for civilians too. These illustrations are part of a collection owned by Malcolm Fair, editor of Sword magazine and owner of the British National Fencing Museum near Malvern. A former British junior fencing champion, Malcolm is also a veteran Commonwealth title holder. His collection focuses on the non-military use of the sword. Civilians are first depicted in paintings in Spain wearing swords that uh, quickly spread to Italy and the Italian Renaissance and the artists available there led fencing masters to produce beautifully illustrated works and those masters uh, spread across Europe teaching young men in all countries the principles of rapier fencing. This book by Dutchman Gerard Thibault, published in 1628, illustrates and analyzes sword moves. The Academy of the Sword is a monumental life's work by one of Europe's renowned swordsmen. Thibault produced a massive catalogue of techniques and insights intended for use by students without access to an instructor. Thibaut himself was an enthusiast of the Spanish rapier. Its long, narrow blade produced the perfect straight line used to intercept an opponent's weapon. Thibaut's book examined posture and movement and encouraged the use of intelligence in defeating an opponent. It was the essential accessory for the young man about town. Despite Gerard Thibault's ideals, the popularity of the rapier also brought about its notoriety. It became the weapon of first resort in settling disputes on the street. But if Hollywood is to be believed, it was also a way of settling them on the high seas. Captain Henry Morgan was the inspiration for this Hollywood version of his life in 1935, starring Errol Flynn in the role of Captain Blood. His flamboyant style suited the rapier. Swords, not pistols, provided pirate films with most of their devil-may-care action. Then I'll take her when you're dead. The real rapier had a lethal blade and developed a decorative guard that bordered on the ornamental. Originally, it was exceptionally long, and rapiers posed a danger to passers-by. Visitors entering London had either to hand in their swords at the city gates or have them cut down to size, which is where the expression comes from. No longer were people using swords which had been designed primarily for use on the battlefield. This was a sword worn by definition by a gentleman, but worn by somebody who'd expect to use it against a similarly armed opponent. And it begins the departure of the sword from a purely military weapon to a weapon which was a badge of social status and a way of settling quarrels between people of a similar background. Ah! 
Europe's aristocrats and moneyed classes went dueling mad. In one year in Italy, there were 300 deaths from dueling. Typically, out of any hundred duelists, a third would be from the military, a third from literary and artistic circles, and the remainder from other walks of life. At the court of Louis XIV, uh, fashions changed, and there was a need for a smaller court sword. This is the sort of sword that evolved with a hollow ground, triangular blade, a very sharp point, and it could be manipulated much more easily than a rapier, and consequently it was much more dangerous. Men fought at the slightest provocation at any time of the day or night, by moonlight or torchlight, in the street or behind closed doors. If you wanted to defend your honor, you needed to have some skill, especially if you had no military training. Swordmasters established themselves in salons and taught self-defense. Expert duelists were soon committing crimes, confident that they could defeat their opponents or rivals in trial by combat. Social reformers, politicians and even senior military figures began to view all duels as a social evil. Despite the anxiety, the madness for dueling continued. If you were a gentleman in the 18th century, you needed to learn how to shoot a pistol and you needed to learn how to fence because you were quite likely either to be challenged to a duel or to be put in circumstances where you'd have to challenge somebody else. And you needed to be able to use a gentleman's weapons, sword and pistol. So learning to fence was really very important because as a gentleman, throughout the 18th century, you'd wear, um, under almost all circumstances, a weapon called a small sword which is a really a reduced weapon of the rapier, you'd wear that, swing at your left hip, and you'd be expected to know how to use it. And wearing the thing and not knowing how to use it was going to get you into dead trouble. In the absence of adequate laws or a police force, the duel delivered a kind of rough justice that prevailed throughout the century. In military circles, there was a new sword on the block the sabre. Developed for use by the cavalry, it was curved and based on designs from the east. The sorts of sword that you needed for fighting on foot and the sorts that you needed for fighting on horseback were really quite different. Uh, a man on horseback needs a sword which is going to give him reach. He'll want to reach out over the horse's neck on one side or on the other. And he might want to use it as one horseman against another, perhaps to stab with a straight arm, or he might want to use it against infantry who are running if he's pursuing them, to give a cut. But in both cases, he needs a weapon that's longer and probably heavier than would be used by a man on foot. In the first decade of the 19th century, the Emperor Napoleon had turned the French army against every major European power. But a coalition of forces defeated Napoleon at Leipzig and exiled him to the island of Elba. In 1815, he escaped from imprisonment and reformed his army with astonishing success his enemies. His army were veterans of earlier campaigns, which included a formidable cavalry. Napoleon was determined to defeat the Allies in what is now Belgium as a first step to rebuilding his empire. The French faced an army of mixed nationality, a British, Dutch and German army of 80,000 troops under the command of the Duke of Wellington were to oppose Napoleon at Waterloo. The Allies were, in the words of Wellington, an infamous army. The scum of the earth. 
weak and ill-equipped with a very inexperienced staff. The battlefield lies just outside of Brussels and has hardly changed since the armies fought each other on June the 18th, 1815. One of the first attacks was made by the French heavy cavalry. Surgeon and historian Mick Crumplin has made a study of sword injuries at Waterloo. I think the two basic uh, types of injury that can be caused by a weapon are those caused by a sharp pointed uh, end and that caused by the downward sweep and the slashing effect of uh, a sabre such as this. But of course if the slash comes to the neck in a horizontal way with the full kinetic energy through the blade of the slashing weapon, it'll decapitate in one go. Or if an artery is sliced in the neck or in a limb, uh, as a limb is almost severed, um, that can cause fairly instantaneous death from bleeding. The British cavalry were led by Lord Uxbury who famously lost his leg in the battle, but continued to direct his troops. They faced Napoleon's heavily armored cavalry. A thrusting weapon such as this French cuirassier sword with its long blade, and if you reach down from a horse with this, you can reach down a long way towards your opponent. And should it pass through just muscle or skin, it's not going to do much harm, particularly in the heat of battle, it might be barely noticed. But if that point were to pass through the chest and the heart and the lungs, uh, there would be fairly instantaneous death. During the Napoleonic Wars, British cavalry used the 1796 pattern sword. For light cavalry, it was curved and heavy, and it was a vicious sword. It was like a meat cleaver. It could lop off arms and ears and that sort of thing. It was very unpopular with the French. The French surgeons were com uh, complaining about the terrible slicing uh, injuries caused by this particular sword, which was a very effective disabling weapon, and it produced the most horrific injuries. These paintings were made by the surgeon and artist Sir Charles Bell, who attended the wounded on the day of battle. The French cavalry sword, which tended to be straight, didn't inflict such dramatic wounds, but just a couple of inches of the point uh, anywhere in the body was enough to kill whereas the 1796 pattern light cavalry used by the British inflicted lots of terrible wounds but killed people comparatively rarely. So one looked awful, the other did the business relatively simply. Infection was probably less likely with sword wounds generally than with gunshot wounds. Swords can cleave in a bit of hair, skin and helmet or leather helmet and that can take bacteria into the bone through the dura mater which is a membrane covering the brain which has a sort of very fluid like consistency in health and if those bits of debris with bacteria ca are carried in by the sword that's often what will finish you. <laughs> There were many brave actions on the day. Sergeant Charles Ewart of the Scots Greys described how he took an eagle standard off the French. I had a hard contest for it. The enemy made a thrust at my groin. I parried it and cut him down through the head. After this, a foot soldier fired at me and charged me with his bayonet. I had the good luck to parry and cut him down through the head. Then a lancer came at me. I cut him through the chin, upwards, through the teeth. Thus ended the contest. The battle like Waterloo, principally they used swords against one another. Uh, and what you would get then, sort of slightly oddly in the middle of a 19th century smoky battlefield, would be cavalrymen going at it, hammer and tongs, and one Eyewitness said that it sounded like a, a thousand coppersmiths at work. The sound of sword on sword and sword on metal breastplate. The French attacked in large formations when they assumed the British lines had broken 
only to find stiff resistance that decimated their cavalry. In the end, Napoleon's fate was sealed when the Prussian army relieved the beleaguered British troops on the evening of June the 18th. Over 40,000 soldiers lay dead or wounded on the field after 10 hours of fighting. Thousands of bodies were stripped by looters during the night. Though the French had lost the battle overall, their cavalry with its straighter stabbing sword was more effective at killing the enemy. This was the style of sword the British army would use in future. It came into play most famously during the Crimean War against the Russians. Outside military circles, things were changing fast. By the mid-19th century, breeches had been replaced by trousers in civilian life, and carrying swords in public went out of fashion. Tailored suits became the normal daywear of men, and dueling for gents faded along with the need to display swords in the street. But the sword continued behind closed doors. It was still a way by which young men showed courage and honor. At least, that's what they claimed in Germany. The Mensa was, and still is, practiced in the older universities. A dueling scar became a badge of honor, a rite of passage for students, and a nod to their ancestors who might have used the sword in a life and death struggle. German sword fighting instructor Alex Kiermeyer explains the background of the Mensa tradition. Don't worry. Die Mensur entstand eigentlich aus dem Bedürfnis heraus, sich zu duellieren. The Mensur grew out of the dueling tradition. It was meant to deal with matters of honor. Then it developed into a practice where you had to discipline yourself, but where you still had an opportunity to prove your courage to your friends. für seine Studentenverbindung beweisen musste. Ja, ich denke, viele Leute Many people who fight in the Mensur nowadays have a kind of macho approach and they want to show how tough they are. But it's really about making a stand and having a commitment to your club. In Germany today, many people have negative feelings about the Mensur. Many people think that the Mensur and its followers are associated with extreme right-wing politics, but that isn't necessarily the case. If you participate in Mensur, you need the Schlager. Its sharp, pointed tip is used to deliver a cut which would give you a desirable scar. Or worse. The Mensur has a whole ritual surrounding it with its own societies and it's considered rather exclusive in places like Heidelberg University. By the last quarter of the 19th century, the sword became exploited by the world of advertising in a mind-boggling range of promotional activities. Even the world of soft porn saw the attraction of its phallic form. This American ad for a farmer's bank must have been the Pirelli calendar of its time. The magic lantern was replaced by early film at the dawn of the 20th century. Recreation and sports became more widespread among all classes and sexes. And this is an early attempt to fight the women's cause. It seems that the woman has outfenced the soldier and he's trying to make excuses to his buddies. He must have been blinded by the moonlight or something. And if that didn't get him, the First World War would. The military still clung to swords. Tradition demanded it. The old guard were convinced that there was still a role for the cavalry in 20th century warfare. <laughs> 
when the First World War began, there were over half a million horses in military service. Cavalry charges were planned, but few were carried out amongst the bomb craters and barbed wire and no man's land. During the 19th century, the British Army was really unable to make its mind up as to whether swords were best used for cutting or thrusting. So it produced a series of patterns of what were called cut and thrust swords, lightly curved blade with a reasonable point, which you could use for both. Uh, eventually, at the very beginning of the 20th century, the British Army decided that the most effective way of fighting with a sword was to thrust. And so it produced its last ever cavalry sword, the 1908 pattern, which was arguably the perfect sword. It had a big bowl guard, a pistol grip, so that you'd line it up naturally, and a straight, slim blade, perfect for thrusting. The perfect weapon produced at exactly the moment that cavalry was leaving the battlefield forever. After four years of fighting and 20 million deaths, Europe was traumatized. By 1918, the world was ready for a good dose of escapism. While tanks and machine guns made the old ways of warfare obsolete, swordsmen continued to flail away at villains. These were the new swashbuckling heroes of a thousand exciting films, like this silent movie. It's based on the Three Musketeers, Almost all swashbuckling films were based on great stories from the past. Many screenwriters adapted 19th century romances and heroic tales, which were often based on ancient myths and legends. They featured men in tights, capable of daring feats and righting wrongs. Embraced by their one true love, these characters strode across the screen with a rapier or broadsword. Robin Hood was always a favorite. For physical movement and a certain visual style, Douglas Fairbanks Sr. was the finest of his generation. In his version of Robin Hood, he showed that the sword was the ideal symbol of justice. The sword was perfectly suited to the free spirit of this cinematic hero and acrobatic champion of the poor. Fairbanks' athletic prowess and dashing good looks made him the king of Hollywood. This version of Robin Hood was made in 1922. It was one of the most expensive films of the times with a $1 million budget. The film broke all box office records and netted a 500% profit for Fairbanks. Sound on feature films was achieved in 1927. By the 30s, the talkies were a global phenomenon and helped secure Hollywood's position as one of the world's most powerful and popular institutions. With the coming of color, older stories were remade. Robin Hood was ripe for a makeover, this time with Errol Flynn in 1938. Once again, the film shows the aristocrat turned outlaw pitted against the Normans and the arch villain the sheriff of Nottingham. Now, this forest is wide. It can shelter and clothe and feed a band of good, determined men, good swordsmen, good archers, good fighters. Are you with me? The sword fights in this film are amongst the best from Hollywood, and they symbolize the struggle against dark forces. The sword symbolically represents the gentlemanly status of the person who bears it. It has often religious overtones, that's not simply in Christianity but in other religions as well. And it also often represents justice against evil. Um, not for nothing does the figure of justice with the scales in one hand have a sword in the other. So in a sense, this classic, simple, cross-hilted sword represents, amongst other things, pure, double-edged justice. World War II has often been called a just war. 
the Americans produced a number of propaganda-led racist films against the Japanese. But the Japanese did execute prisoners by beheading. Some of their victims were of European descent, but the Japanese treated their Chinese and Korean neighbors as if they were subhuman. Thousands of these Asians were executed by the sword with the blessing of Emperor Hirohito and his generals. In Europe, there was conflict too. The Germans used swords and daggers for ceremonial purposes. Many of these were based on imperial Roman styles. The Nazis were always looking for stories or symbols which linked them to, as they saw it, a glorious past. Many of the daggers were made in the town of Solingen, famous in medieval times for the finest broadswords. In 1945, Hitler was defeated. As the Second World War ended and society stabilized, new theatrical productions were made for radio and cinema. These were mimicked by children at play and reflected the actions of their heroes. In the movies, the sword was a central prop in many epic films, including Alexander the Great starring Richard Burton. The film was made in 1956. Alexander, conqueror of conquerors, whose ambition knew no bounds. Here are the it's the story of how Alexander united the Greeks against the Persian Empire and how he went on to conquer all before him with sword in hand. A new generation of Hollywood swashbuckling actors have joined the ranks of the famous names of the past. Johan Griffith, star of Horatio Hornblower, and the Fantastic Four has also played one of the great mythic heroes of the past. My latest uh, part playing uh, a character that needed a sword was uh, Lancelot in King Arthur. And there I got to brandish two swords uh, on, on the back of the horse, uh, which made for a very sort of uh, sexy unsheathing of those swords. They were sort of on a leather satchel on my back. And you know, when you unsheathed them there, there was a, sort of a, a sexy moment and a very sort of defining moment for the character. Well, it looks uh, incredibly real when you see it on film. So when we are actually working together, because it is work, it's not sort of pretending. We are, you know, going for direct hits that we've choreographed very carefully. You'd start very slowly and deliberately. You know, I go here, you go there, this happens, and st until it starts to instill itself in your muscles and in your muscle memory. Matthew Rees is another Hollywood actor who knows about the risks of stage fighting from playing several leading Shakespearean roles. Part of the excitement or the adrenaline for me is knowing that if something does go wrong, a large element of yourself is responsible for getting yourself out of it, either defending or parrying or making sure you don't get hurt. But one can cheat the, uh, the idea that we, I am actually trying to cut your head off with an intention rather than actually physically going for somebody's head. The culture these days is gun associated and as our, as my f fighting teacher always always said that um you know any anyone can pull a trigger but the sword itself is, a, is an extension of you it's an, basically an, an extension of your arm therefore it's really only your your skill that in, in its purest form that you know differentiates life and death it's down to you one of the biggest films that shows life and death struggles was produced in 1960. Many of the sword fighting scenes directed by Stanley Kubrick were cut from the final release prints because at the time they were thought too gory for the audience. Starring Kirk Douglas as Spartacus, slave, gladiator, invincible fighter. The film won four Oscars at that year's Academy Awards ceremony a fitting tribute, as the Oscar statuette actually holds a historic sword in his hands. In the 1950s and 60s, children's matinees nourished the next generation of cinema goers. Some of the films they saw ended up on television, and the sword and its heroes continued to enthrall boys and girls of all ages. One of the biggest and most successful characters was Zorro. 
story of Zorro is set in old Spanish California, where the hero fights for the ordinary people against a tyrannical governor. Zorro uses a short rapier, similar in style to the weapon found in many fencing academies today. Leon Paul is Britain's biggest and oldest sword fencing manufacturer. The company, which was established in London by Frenchman Leon Paul in 1925, has an international reputation. Paul began as a fencing master and soon after started to produce his own equipment. The firm developed and built their own forges, presses, welders and moulding equipment. One of the most innovative machines is this hot metal forger. The steel billet is cut to conform to the desired sword shape and the forge can be adapted to suit a variety of templates. The grandson of the founder is Barry Paul, the current chief executive of the company. He's a former British foil champion and Olympic fencer and understands the virtues of keeping everything in-house. Of course, manufacturing yourself gives a huge advantage of flexibility. You can make new things, try new things. One of the uh, advantages of being able to make uh, all our equipment here is that when uh, film directors ask for a special equipment to be made, uh, we can make it and normally produce something within days, if not hours. And in fact, um, James Bond died another day, we were there um, supplying kit for the various fences. A special kit was uh, needed. James Bond wants a left-handed one of those, or uh, the villain needs something in black or something. And so it's a great advantage being able to make stuff yourself. The founder, Leon Paul, was in demand as a stage fight director. He taught film actors after the Second World War, since when his grandsons have followed in his footsteps. The costume, essential to the sport, is also made here. Face masks, invented by the French in the late 18th century to accompany the training sword, made the sport safer, especially for instructors who had to engage with students of mixed ability. It wasn't unknown for a swordmaster to lose an eye while teaching a novice. Nowadays, masks are obligatory and injuries are rare. The speed of modern fencing used to make judging hits difficult. Electrification of the sword began in the 1930s and took 50 years to be fully effective in all categories. A cable is attached to a telescopic tip and illuminates a light when a hit is made. The company supplied and sponsored the American and British teams at the last Olympic Games. Since the modern games were introduced in 1896, fencing has been one of the few sports to be included at every event since that date. Traditionally, the sport has been dominated by the Europeans, Currently, the most successful nation is France, with Italy and Germany close behind. But the Americans and Chinese are catching up. Fencing clubs provide training in various types of sword. The epée has a three-sided blade. It's a descendant of the dueling sword and is used in thrusting. Its target area is the whole body. So, what qualities do you need in this game? World-class fencers are selfish, uh, determined, aggressive, intelligent. The Olympic fencers probably take 10 years to create. The fencing sabre is the heavier sword. Scoring is achieved by both cutting and thrusting actions to the upper body, arms and head. It is said that the point of a fencing weapon is the second fastest object in sport after a bullet. The scoring lights help the judges, but they have an effect on the action too. Electrification changed the emphasis from making an attack so that judges could see your point arriving to hitting anywhere on the valid target provided the electrical apparatus registered the hit.
speed, not power, gets results. Especially for the foil, a favorite with beginners. Though it's a regular competition sword too, it's a thrusting weapon and hits a scored by striking the torso. Swords have also entered the world of reenactment and lifestyle. The Knights Gone By store in North Wales sells replica swords from all periods for use by collectors and those who enjoy what's called living history. People of all ages who use weapons and costumes to transform themselves into knights or pirates or Romans. Here the sword appeals to historians and fantasy enthusiasts alike. For those who want to connect with the spiritual roots of sword fighting, there's kendo. This is Akai Ryu, Red Dragon Club in South Wales. Kendo means the way of the sword. It's a comparatively modern Japanese martial art and aims to mold the mind and body and to cultivate a vigorous spirit. Originally, Samurai warriors used the sword to kill people. However, the Edo period of the 17th century was a more peaceful time. It was then that the practice of kendo was developed. The idea was not to kill people, but to educate them. There are many elements to kendo. An honest heart is most important. We can easily build up a strong body, but it is difficult to build up a true and honest heart. With a good heart, you can be open to many things and see many things. To some Europeans, spiritual matters can feel out of reach. In Kendo, spirit is important. Breathing, willpower, and spirit are all connected in Kendo. We use these things to discipline ourselves and we try to raise the quality of kendo for ourselves and our opponents. The inspiration for this activity is the samurai warrior. So how is the katana blade regarded by kendo experts? Originally, the katana sword was a symbol with a godlike status. It was not just a cutting weapon. The katana is still a noble and holy sword. Kendoists shout to express their fighting spirit when striking, something which is rooted in Japanese martial culture. But for some, the sword can have a very different interpretation. The ceremonies and rituals which form part of the Royal Nationalist Edward of Wales are a rich mixture of tradition and imagination created by Yolo Morganug, the founder of the ancient Druidic Order of Britain. The sword in these ceremonies is a potent symbol of peace. The sheath of the great ceremonial sword is inscribed with words that emphasize its peaceful purpose. Its hilt is decorated with a dragon of Wales and a natural crystal to represent mysticism. At the climax of the ceremony in which a poet is honored, the great sword is raised, and in response to the question, is there peace, the audience shout, peace. The sword ritual was a part of Yolo's Godsedh from the beginning in 1792. But it wasn't a sword in the sense of a weapon, but a sword that symbolized the fact that the poets of the Godsedh circle were a peaceful fellowship. The sword is never fully unsheathed and is not held by the hilt. <laughs> 
This is not a sword meant for killing people. In military circles, the sword no longer has a role as a weapon, but is used symbolically to represent rank and power. Wilkinson's sword was one of the largest suppliers of swords to the armed services. They were particularly skilled at making decorative officers' swords. Officers got their uniforms from their regimental military tailor, and they provided offered the gen young gentleman the sword, and they were known to be you know, not of the highest quality. They could easily bend or break when they were used, and this annoyed Henry Wilkinson so much that that's why he embarked on the venture to make Britain the makers of the finest swords in the world. For 200 years, the company supplied all ranks with cold steel. But with a reduction in the size of armed services in recent years, Wilkinson's changed direction the sword part of the business was sold off. Sword hilts are covered in shark or ray skins, which provide good grip. These traditional techniques have remained part of the production process despite the changes in company ownership. The German company, WKC, based in Solingen, a traditional sword-making area, bought some of the equipment from Wilkinson, but the British firm Pooley Swords also acquired many of the drawings, records and machinery. Pooley's sent the heavy equipment out to India for the forging of blades. India was, for hundreds of years, renowned for the quality of its metalwork and weapons. All the new generation swords are made from carbon steel. Then they're sent to England for finishing and assembly. The British Armed Services, as well as overseas defense forces, still place orders for new swords. But pulleys also provide an important restoration and repair service. Etched blades usually carry the defining insignia of a regiment and confirm the sword as a ceremonial weapon. Pooley supply swords to the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst, where the leadership qualities demanded of an officer are taught to cadets. Swords are the main feature of the Sovereign's Parade, where these young men are finally commissioned into the army. The overseas sword is awarded to the best foreign cadet, and the sword of honor is awarded to the most outstanding cadet of his intake. History is a source of pride to armies, and swords provide some continuity with the past, but there are also swords for kings and queens. This sword was made to commemorate the coronation of the British Queen, Elizabeth II, in 1953. The sword is in the style of an epée, decorated with precious stones. The most futuristic take on swords was created in cinema's Star Wars series. It introduced lightsabers to the world and still inspires fans who want to save the universe, like these backstreet heroes. Despite Star Wars being the most technical tour de force on screen, when it comes down to saving the universe, it's flashing blades and a sword in hand that the filmmakers chose. Throughout human history, edged weapons have enabled us to hunt and to defend ourselves. From the Stone Age, with its flint knives, to the first age of metals and the earlier swords, our ancestors have fought and made blades that enabled great civilizations to succeed. The seeds of that success have also produced the dark side of human activity. But where there are villains, there are heroes. Ancient myths and legends have sent us sword-wielding saviors to protect us from evil. The sword story constantly throws up episodes in which religious or political conflicts have tested our metal. The 13th century was a high mark for the sword, since when it's fought for its place at the great events that determined our future. <laughs>
civil wars and revolutions have seen its bloody contribution. But it's also been exploited by artists and writers and been turned into a sport fit for kings and emperors. Horses gave swords a place on the battlefield, but with the coming of the 20th century and military mechanization, swords had to find an alternative role. Adventure stories and popular cinema provided it and inspired new generations of young blades to test their courage. The sword has symbolized the fight against evil, so it's no wonder that most societies have celebrated the perfect sword. Thank you.